I'm taking this seriously. I wore pants. I appreciate that. I would very much appreciate it if you did. Um, all right. So it is a guided interview. So there are parts of it that are slightly scripted, but it's meant to be as free formed of a conversation as possible. Um, with like me sort of bringing you back to certain points along the way. Um, so we'll get started. So thank you for agreeing to do this one on one with me. Um, as you know, the aim of this interview is to explore your experiences within the domains of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Your participation in this interview is voluntary, so if at any point you want to step out, take a break, pause, and early, you're welcome to do so. Just let me know. Yes? Excellent. I am. Um, and yes. These interviews are recorded in order to generate transcripts, which will be anonymized. So if any um, names or identifiers are mentioned, they will be taken out after the fact. So, you know, feel free otherwise. Um, do I have your consent to start? Yes, please. And I'm amazed it's recording, taking dictation as we do this. That yeah. is so I mean, it's saving me work on the other side, having to, like, transcribe this. Okay. Um so before we get started, do you have any questions for me? But, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you checked yourself because you realize this is recorded. <laughs> um, so for the record, um, can you please state your age, your gender, and your role at the Cancer Center? Uh, I'm a cisgender white guy, uh, 51 medical oncologist, associate professor. Beautiful. Um, so the very first question asks you to define or explain three specific terms, and we'll take them, like, in sequential order. So how would you define or explain the term equity to someone? There's a, a nice little uh, picture um, uh, that, that I think defines it of three people looking over the fence, one of whom is Shrinky. Or uh, height non-enhanced yet, because they're yep. maybe going to grow, unless they have dwarfism, in which case it's okay. That's okay, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, and um, so th th this is funny because uh, the difference between equality and equity. Equality, everybody gets the same chance. Equity, everybody gets the tools to achieve the same result, yes. ideally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then justice, this is what I think is really cool about it. Justice means there's no barriers to anybody in the first place. Yeah. That, like, it is that very quintessential comic representation of, like, equality versus equity versus justice, like, looking over to the baseball field. Um, I think it illustrates it quite, quite well. Um, how would you define or explain the term diversity to someone? Uh, I guess it's slightly contextual, but diversity to me is defined by uh, both a presence and an acceptance of a variety of genetic backgrounds, cultures, religions, uh, self-expression orientation within a space. Fair. Um, and then in that line, how would you define or explain inclusivity or inclusion? That's interesting. I guess I would say inclusivity or inclusion is a functional act of diversity. In what way? In that you are executing diversity, uh, I suppose, by eliminating barriers to having diversity. So we are Everyone. getting rid of diversity? Is that what you're saying? Now we're getting rid of barriers to diversity. Inclusivity is the execution of diversity. Okay. The making happening of. The making happening of. The diversification. <laughs> All right. Good to know. Um, so keeping those definitions and themes in mind, do you see these domains um, influencing the clinician-patient encounter? And if so, in what ways? I guess the answer has to be yes, and probably the challenge is that it's mostly insidious, uh, and we don't kind of see what we're missing. Uh, we know that people who are of a uh, higher educational background or better economic means 
fare better, I think, in a variety of health conditions, perhaps as partly a result of simply healthy lifestyles, but also self-advocacy and probably also clinician response to those individuals. So it exists. Uh, how, how does it manifest? I mean, I, I suppose, you know, in, in concrete ways, probably decisions on treatment or likelihood of treatment. Although it feels like day to day, I would tend to deny that I behave that way, as I suspect everybody would do. Everybody would deny. Um, uh, maybe I don't know if you want to uh, ask an additional question. Yeah. I'm kind of so I know that you one thing that you mentioned was physicians' response to when you mentioned like um, perhaps people with higher uh, education or higher affluence um, can advocate for themselves better, but perhaps also influence the way that that physicians will respond to that advocacy. What do you mean by that? Um. Actually, I'm not sure I meant to respond to that advocacy per se. Uh, I, I think I, what I meant is how the patient responds to the individual and individuals who self-advocate are just going to tend to do better. Um, would it matter if the person who was advocating was of a visible minority uh, or other minority? Would that change the behavior of the clinician? I don't know. I don't know how you'd measure that. I mean, I, I have to imagine it could, but it mm -hmm. probably depends on the individual and how defensive they are and how flexible they are. And mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. And then you also mentioned that, you know, though we may not recognize it, it could influence treatment decisions or treatment options that you are willing to talk to certain patients about. Like, can you explore that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by that? I know you said that you aim not to, but what could happen? Yeah, I, the one concrete example where it probably I, I would be, um, and I know this from a recent a recent camo presentation as well, and access to palliative care for individuals with um, kind of uh, homelessness or shelter mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, kind of a reluctance to treat patients who may have difficulty maintaining adherence and reporting side effects. So judging ability to manage treatment, maybe before even ex not experimenting, but assessing whether it might simply work. Mm -hmm. um, Fair. Yeah. Um, so then I want you to think about in your own lived experiences professionally, um, can you recall an encounter um, or a particular like patient case um, where these domains directly played a role in the interaction that you had? So, you know, whether it influenced decision making, whether it influenced the trust that was established, whether it influenced, you know, the way news was broken, like anything in those facets. This is uh, hard to answer because I feel there's so many potential ways of approaching it uh, from the perspective of diversity. Because well, it's whatever triggers, right? So it's the idea yeah. of exploring what comes to mind. I mean, diversity is not exclusive of um, immigration, which is not exclusive of language skills. Uh, and so certainly. And I, I, that's probably not what we really mean by diversity, but, you know, navigating um, a uh, individual who's been in Canada for a few years and may have limited language skills is obviously different, but that's not strictly maybe the issue. But, it, but it's certainly going to impede ability to get clear consent and convey inf information that's not really bias. Um, well, let's explore this this ex example first, if you have other anecdotes that come up. So when you talk about perhaps barriers in language, um, what have you seen manifested clinically um, and how have those discussions perhaps been different, similar um, than ones that you would have with someone who is a native English speaker? Uh, <clears throat> there can be the, bar the pure barrier of language and then the barrier of, I guess, culture. Example being 
some families who don't want to pass on to the patient their true diagnosis, limiting what we perceive to be as, you know, kind of full autonomy and consent. Um, so that is a source of discomfort. <clears throat> I'm not sure it limits treatment. Um, there's, you know, similarly, the way we present things is very Western centric. I'm afraid I think it's largely right. Um, and that patients need to know and make choices. It's where it's how I'm trained. Uh, and so, you know, I, we, we exert that to some extent. And I think I will tend to at least gently suggest that, uh, autonomy, et cetera, is important. Patient has to be able to know to make choices. They probably already know, et cetera. So there's definitely a little cultural friction there as an example. How do you bridge that, that difference or that tension or that divide where, you know, you are coming from it from the experience of what you have been trained to do, what you have been told is um, the center most value of, of patient decision making contended against perhaps a cultural milieu where the family is just like, this isn't, I, them knowing is not the best thing for them. How do you, how do you bridge that? I think partly by trying to improve communication, offering translators, for example, to get over that barrier in a more direct way, uh, partly by negotiating and indicating that, you know, we will only tell the patient maybe as much as they want to know, you know, offer them the opportunity for information, but not going to force a particular, you know, prognosis or anything on them. And partly by shrugging and just letting it be because there's only so much you can do or care to do. Mm -hmm. And how do you contend with your own emotions or frustrations in that setting um, when it clearly is, you know, something that you perhaps don't agree with? Face-to-face uh, -face with the patient, I certainly try to uh, take a few deep breaths and, and show minimal emotion about it. Uh, and then I will go complain to my nurse and vent. Fair. <laughs> Valid. <laughs> um, and then are there any other examples that have come to mind um, in the last little bit that, you know, draw examples of other perhaps um, avenues of like access to care or inequitable access to care or, or you know, other veins of healthcare provision you had to explore for a patient? I, I feel like I, I feel a little bad because I feel like this is, this is hard to, to answer in part because I, you know, I'm very, I consider myself to be a very pro immigrant diversity, you know, um, culture interested individuals. So I kind of perceive that once they get to me, I am, you know, at least open, if not necessarily savvy to a given culture. Um, what, what happens before patients get to us is, I guess that's not really what we're talking about today, but you know, that's a question in terms of access. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like once they're to us, they all have the potential opportunity for treatment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They may have lags in their treatment because we have to delay for communication, mm -hmm. um, contact family members. This is just practical stuff, though. This is, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and again, I'm thinking I seem to be on a track of, of uh, language barrier immigration kind of situation here rather than other aspects of diversity. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a difference, uh, like in terms of, um, non cisgender individuals? I really don't think so. Uh, or at least from my perspective, you know, conscious of trying to use open terms, not pressing more than people want. Mm -hmm. Uh, although sometimes trying to figure out what their support structure is can be challenging without a little bit of probing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in terms of female versus male, I don't think there's any real issue there. Mm -hmm. 
um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't find it terribly troubling, but I, I also recognize that there's all sorts of stuff I'm probably insensitive to. So what about an example where you have borne witness either as a trainee yourself um, or of a colleague or now as a preceptor of a trainee having one of these encounters where they've done it either very, very well, where there is like um, an exploration of these other aspects of a person's personhood or somewhere where it's been done very, very poorly. So like a highly positive or a negative interaction that stands out in your mind that you were witness to. I really can only think of communication examples where the relevant oncologic information has been conveyed well, Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's generic to any person receiving the information. Um, I don't know. I I mean, this is not the same thing at all, but uh, you know, certainly had female residents referred to as a nurse. This, I know it's not mm-hmm. the same, uh, response. No, but which, they, like explore that. Explore what those encounters yeah. are like, what your role in that is and, and what you do or what that person, um, hopes for from you, um, as the preceptor in, in that encounter. Yeah. So I, I try to be uh, conscious of referring, um, First off, to uh, female residents in particular by uh, doctor last name. Mm-hmm. The only complication from that being I'm really bad with names, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, and and certainly if someone refers to a a a resident as a nurse, which has only ever happened with female residents, uh, then then I correct that and indicate you know doctor so-and-so you know told me that or oh no this is doctor so-and-so what have you mm-hmm. so a gentle correction mm-hmm. um have you ever been um and have you ever been sort of sought out by a trainee um to sort of help or champion or advocate on their behalf where they have felt like they've been um not discriminated against necessarily because that's what can be a hard word, but where they have faced barriers and being able to do their job. I don't know that I've been sought out, but I've, I've certainly had probably two incidences and it's been a long time, but uh, where incidents uh, where a resident um, has been at least a tangential target of a racial comment, uh, you know, typically I'm afraid by older patients uh and have had to just tell them that that's not no longer acceptable i can't say that um I, you know typically uh, very briefly would debrief with uh, with the resident after um just you know uh I suppose something of an apology um but that's usually the extent of it um or some yeah that that's it. I, it's been a long time, to be honest, since since I've, I've heard a comment like that. But it really okay. pisses me off. How is it received by the patient who said the comment when you sort of put proverbially your foot down? Yeah, this is this would be a hazy, distant memory. But as I recall, you know, mostly quiet. I think recognizing that you know, hopefully recognizing they're out of bounds or. Mm-hmm. Maybe just not hearing me because they don't have their hearing aids in because they're too <laughs> stubborn. Fair. Um, so when you think back and we'll think of it in sort of chunks of your um, professional career as a staff oncologist versus your training um, in oncology, have you ever received formal um, training as it related to that role in these domains? No, would be the short answer. I think, um, you know, re- the only thing would be there are references to CCO modules on um, Indigenous populations in Canada, uh, which have been offered. 
which I have always thought would be a great idea to do, but never have mustered the time to undertake. Uh, and, but nothing, nothing in any program or course that I recall. Anything earlier in your training? So like internal medicine or med school? I really don't think so. And so have you in your own time, um, sought out any training or informal, um, exposure to, to learn more? Other than attending perhaps, you know, rounds with relevant topics, uh, I would say no formal courses, uh, or the like. Um, yeah. So how, how I, have I you learned? There's a, there's a, sorry, I was going to say there's a kind of a, a passive, you know, absorption, um, you know, like literally recognizing when I read the newspaper, there are sometimes things that, uh, I kind of feel like, oh, I've heard it again and again. But I will, you know, read through the article because I may be um, able to get, glean something from the topic. Uh, and so this could be um, uh, indigenous um, interactions with the clergy, uh, you know, contemporary stuff, et cetera. Uh, just recognizing that, you know, I probably should know something about this, uh, even if, you know, it kind of feels like it never ends and where does that motivation come from like why if no one's telling you to do it why do it well it's not a huge uh, investment i suppose but um i think it's a little bit just a, a bit from the same uh, stem as the my pro immigration uh, feelings is that you know, the ideal candidate to me rep is represented by uh, a motley crew uh, and uh, and some, um, you know, I guess uh, familial relevance in terms of uh, gender issues, uh, issues, that sounds negative, gender considerations, um, so that I'm just aware of it. Uh, and I just, to, to some extent, find it find it interesting. And so when in, so it's a two-parter. So um, when did you first become aware, like maybe perhaps not with the same nomenclature or labeling of EDI, but first become privy to the idea that these were things that mattered, that they influenced people's lives, um, that there were these differences and disparities that existed? I mean, I don't think it's a, that there's a concrete medical education moment where this has come up. It's been, you know, drip, drip over time, various sources. Um, you know, I think for me, the notion of humans as being diverse probably stemmed from university and having a platonic uh, and initially completely ignorant relationship with a gay man. Um, and uh deriving just experience of of uh of that community subsequently um and it was like this as they say it's one of the best things about you know leaving home and going off to school is the stuff you don't learn in class uh and so i i don't know i think that's just the seed and just you know coming from an accepting family etc that that's uh i suppose put me in a relatively open-minded kind of um thing and then the rest of it's just hearing from people and and news and you know low-grade medical education but nothing formal and and no aha moment otherwise and were there ever any discussions or um reflections that you were faced with or engaged in that that made you um, sort of contend with your own lived experiences, perhaps like biases that you carried that you then had to recognize? Um, and, and if so, how did that make you feel? I'm not sure if this is exactly answering the question, but I, I think hearing from my um, better pigmented uh, friends and colleagues about uh, racial experiences that they have encountered, you know, whether it's at a hotel or a restaurant or, or whatnot. Um, 
I suppose has made me aware of, of the reality of it, even as I personally experienced none of it mm-hmm. as a, um, and in terms of how it made me feel, I suppose, you know, obviously bad for them, slightly irritated, um, and simply more aware, uh, I kind of want to add periods after I complete a sentence. (laughs) Period. (laughs) And are these conversations, especially as EDI has become very much part of like societal zeitgeist and like the day to day kitsch vernacular, are these conversations you're having with colleagues with within your division department or with trainees? Mostly with you. Uh, sporadically, not intentionally, I guess. We have a very diverse resident pool. Mm -hmm. If one excludes the fact that I cannot think of a single, um, you know, black Canadian amongst, you know, our staff or our trainees, uh, other than a rare elective student. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, I feel like we live it largely mm-hmm. rather than, I don't know. Well, I mean, you mentioned sporadically there are these conversations. And is that more about, like, systems issues or systems processes? Or is it more about, like, anecdotal, like, this happened to me or, like, this happened? Probably more anecdotal. Uh, for the greater part, probably the most common uh, EDI conversations I have are with my wife, who is an educator and highly involved in this and is a strong proponent. Mm-hmm. And so what are some maybe conversations that she's brought home um, that have been, you know, illuminating? Well, I suppose um, we do sometimes uh, get excited in our conversations. Uh, You know, one example that probably, you know, frames my um, background a little bit is the uh, question of the guilt of the current generation for um, acts against the Indigenous peoples of Canada. Um, and I suppose that's a long list of badness. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we have had uh, conversations about, you know, what kind of responsibility we have and, you know, how, what component of, of guilt we have uh, and culpability uh, and what to do about it. And actually we have a um, friend who's a landscape architect and we've had separate conversations with her about projects that she had been doing and interactions that she had had. Um, but I suppose there's, you know, I, in terms of feeling, there's sometimes this tension uh, of um, trying to figure out, and this is actually specific to uh, Canada's uh, indigenous people. Um, you know, what is our, individual you know guilt and liability um how do we proceed you know forward um what is expect what is the expected you know uh resource emotional financial cost to us etc uh and i find certainly that at times um i can feel irritated at simply the accusation of being a uh, a cisgender white male Mm -hmm. uh, while recognizing that it has almost certainly had advantages. Um, It also feels a little bit like a crime sometimes, which doesn't help with trying to, achieve buy-in, I guess. How do you reconcile that dichotomy in yourself? I suppose the problem is I have the luxury of not worrying about it. 
uh, on one hand, um, you know, I can acknowledge the irritation, acknowledge the, uh, that as our landscape architect friend uh, said, um, really our role now is to try to avoid propagating these problems moving forward. Um, and that seems like a role that I can buy into readily. Uh, the other fact is that a lot of these things don't change because they don't affect our day-to-day lives. Uh, unfortunately, if, you know, uh, a, a given Canadian has a poor access to drinking water, uh, high rates of, uh, uh, sorry, ludicrous rates of tuberculosis, mm-hmm. uh, or, um, other challenges, uh, I don't see that moment to moment or day to day. Mm-hmm. So it makes it easy to reconcile in a way. It's kind of like starvation in Yemen. Mm-hmm. It's a problem that I don't see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's fair. So all of that being said and reflected on as a bit of a pivot, how comfortable do you feel with these domains, these conversations, um, these, you know, facets of care? Um, and what are some like learning curves or learning edges that you see in yourself as you go forward in the rest of your professional career? In terms of how it affects care that I provide, being cognizant of the issues is probably a little bit helpful. Mm -hmm. Probably insufficient. I suspect that some sort of, sounds silly, but basic training in you know, um, Muslim practices, Jewish practices, indigenous uh, spiritual practices, et cetera, might facilitate how we communicate, deal with end of life issues, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, as I, we talked about before in terms of feeling a strong devotion to the Western centric notion of autonomy. Mm-hmm. I probably have similar tendencies that I don't see when talking to, um, you know, an indigenous person who actually has a close relationship with, with, uh, um, you know, a, a reserve and a community and, um, spiritual leaders that I really don't talk to and, or can even incorporate into a conversation. Mm-hmm. Is this going to motivate me to go out and try to find some, class on this uh, unfortunately the answer is probably no mm-hmm. uh, because there are so many more things that are interesting and time consuming mm-hmm. uh, which is not to say it doesn't have value or not to say that uh, some sort of time shouldn't be spent on it so you mentioned the idea of like training for familiarity um for just being aware um, of these different practices that can influence the way in which we meet people in their cancer journeys, where would you see that training brought in? Yeah, I I think, you know, when you think even about the um, smoking cessation and how how many uh, of us have felt some discomfort in terms of the whole, you know, um, ask, advise, assist, assess, which I always mess up, even though I've, you know, gone through this a thousand times, but at least you have the notions. And, and the verbiage and, and an approach for something that really doesn't have a lot of kind of cultural issues, although it does have some, you know, stigma and so forth. You know, I think it really does suggest that, uh, we could gain some reasonable knowledge about, uh, cultural aspects or something that, of course, are not going to be, uh, profoundly deep, but could still be meaningful and useful and just practical. And I think it's probably something that we don't want to have to wait, uh, you know, 30 years for it to become ubiquitous, uh, meaning that it can't just be in medical school and maybe arguably is of less use in medical school in some respects. Yeah. Probably it's a little bit like, 
you know, our primary school system is that you need some fundamental concepts. And then when you are a resident and or staff, you need to have some more practical aspects of it, apprenticeorial kind of things. Uh, and so that could be, um, you know, kind of sh- short half day uh, courses with um, uh, the, um, you know, dialogues or uh, kind of, you know, uh, experienced um, kind of like, not, not, not an OSCE, but a, a situation in which you can uh, kind of experiment and, and try things out and practice a little bit. Mm. I don't think rounds of, are probably enough, although you can get some good messages across, you know, with a good speaker and, and, and uh, good insight. Mm-hmm. Do you make that obligatory? You know, um, does the uh, college, uh, you know, the Royal College give um, Section 4 credits, which are for, uh, and I'm not joking, you know, cultural um, understanding and diversity awareness? Um, that may be one way of approaching it. Uh, and it, uh, and in a way, we could mandate it through, you know, conferences and so forth is that, uh, you know, there may be extra credit or whatever if you can incorporate aspects of this. Although how you construct the, you know, sessions and, who's qualified, et cetera, is beyond me. How do you prevent the tokenism of it all, right? Just throwing it in for the sake of throwing it in as opposed to it being a meaningful learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think, yeah, if you're just uh, saying that a random conference needs to have a component of this, then it's going to be uh, less value. Um, You know, I I confess that uh, if you want to talk about, you know, how we feel about things, (laughs) <laughs> that you know the 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 uh spoken recognition of the you know traditional land that we are undertaking a conference on or a talk or whatever um probably loses meaning after a certain number of iterations mm-hmm. you know when it's done as it's done because people feel they have to do it um but conversely does that normalize a language that like didn't exist 10 years ago yes has to i suppose yeah and like is that is that conscientiousness or even that like deliberate practice albeit as you know, reflexive as it can be nowadays, like, does that serve a purpose in still advancing um, people's understanding than if not, than not having it at all? I, th- I think that's a good point. And I think it's probably a question of dosing. You know, if it's before every single talk and every single act, it, it becomes un, uh, unhelpful. But uh, if it becomes, if it's, uh, you know, spaced and before things that are actually meaningful, um, <clears throat> then it is probably uh, more relevant. Fair. Yeah, yeah, no, I like normalization. The normalization is a is a it's a good uh, good concept. Well, because uh, I is, I think of it from the standpoint of buy in, right? Like those who are motivated to engage and to learn and to try will always be motivated to do so, right? They will seek out experiences of their own volition. My question is always, how do you motivate the middle ground, the apathetic, the uninterested? Um, and does it necessarily have to be through the sense of just like repetition and normalization um, in order to change very entrenched practices? One of the other challenges is, uh, and, and we came to this from the pride flag. So the pride flag, you know, d- developed a little um, rect- uh, triangle or chevron that included uh, there's a brown and a black uh, curve there. And actually we, we were, a bunch of really uh, woke folk were looking at this going, I'm not sure what the difference between the black one is and the brown one. We seem to like, and so we're having a debate. And then someone pointed out there's now a circle um, that, uh, that, that was added. Uh, and the only point being is that uh, from something that was an LGBTQ, uh, you know, twin spirited flag, uh, you can, 
overwhelm or dilute the cause by simply adding in everything that is a little bit different, acknowledging that black gay people probably have different issues than white gay people, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the question is what what is your what is your cause and how do you do it? So if we have an indigenous statement. How does that ha- – well, it doesn't help. It's not supposed to help. But but it does not help other visible minorities in Canada. It does not help, uh, you know, queer persons, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we can't have, you know uh, – well, I suppose we could, but it might be impractical to have a much longer <laughs> – Welcome, welcome to Turtle Island, where there may be gay people and there may be different colored people. <laughs> it becomes uh, maybe it a would take bit. quite a long while to It'd get. It'd be a long to deal, yeah. yeah. Um, now, as a, all, I, you know, all, they're all relevant issues that need to be uh, advanced, right? Yeah. So, bit of a pivot as a question. Um, thinking of your own lived experiences, have you? ever been a part of an encounter where someone else has made assumptions about you or attributed um, certain labels to you that affected you either professionally or personally, whether it was a colleague, a superior, or even a patient assumed things about you that, you know, colored the interaction you had with them? Well, I've had people think I was gay before, but I really don't care. I think it's kind of entertaining. Um. Uh, I kind of figure it's like because I dress up decently sometimes. So <laughs> I probably just stereotype somebody. Anyway, um, you know, I guess yeah, I'm trying to think. This is not the same thing at all, um, but the closest thing that, that uh, I, I, I have to getting some sort of unusual, arguably inappropriate sentiment directed at me, and it's um, little old uh, lady patient uh, people uh, telling me, commenting on my looks or my age or something like that. And I really could care less, except that, you know, I sometimes note that if it was in a different situation, um, you know, of of uh, power or gender or something that it could be uncomfortable for somebody. Um, I don't much care. Uh, but um, and so yeah. It, but but I think I'm coming from that from a fairly confident, you know, middle aged uh, white guy perspective who kind of doesn't have to worry about it from any perspective. So maybe that's why I don't care, and maybe because I'm in a perverse way, a little flattered, um, even though you're not supposed to be. Uh, so, yeah, but I, I guess maybe it just speaks to either the fact that I'm oblivious to some things um, or, I, I, you know, I suppose one, in, the only instance I can think of, i got to be honest, and again, this maybe just because of where, it might, you know, cisgender white guy, is uh, someone said to me that, uh, you know, I looked at your picture on Google and I didn't like you. And it turns out I like you. So uh, this is before coming to a consultation. Um, so that would be probably as close to, you know, I suppose if I was uh, a visible minority, you know, that would really, then I, I might be thinking that that's what they saw. But instead, I actually have a photo, my photo, one of my staff photos. I don't particularly like it, actually. It's just the way I'm laughing and my nose is up and I look a little... I look a little cheeky or snotty or something, and I can imagine that's what they saw. But nevertheless, in terms of how I felt, you know, it was, um, you know, I guess a little offended. Uh, I did think about that picture, and if that's kind of what they were seeing, um, and I guess I've remembered it, although I can't say it particularly stings. It was just mm-hmm. notable, and it's being different. Mm-hmm. Like, it was a judgment that this patient came into the encounter with with you. Um, So, like, it wasn't as if they were walking into that appointment neutral in their regard for you. If anything, you know, you didn't do it conscientiously, but unconsciously you were trying to, not trying, but, like, essentially aiming to reverse this opinion that they had formed already. Yeah, and and, and if, uh, if you feel like you have to do that every time you go into a clinic room, uh, then I think that's really shit. Um, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I hope for the most part you don't, but I, 
have to imagine that it's possible you do, you know, little white Eastern European guy, just to stereotype a little bit. Um, yeah, that's not fun. No. Um, now, as a last question to the uh, interview, is there anything that we've not covered over the course of this conversation that you think is relevant to be discussed as it relates to the research topic that is understanding how oncologists learn about and, and understand the domains of EDI in clinical care? No, uh, although one thing I thought we were going to talk, I guess we did talk about it a little bit is like, uh, residents and students and the interactions and so forth. Um, I'm sure what else we could. Well, add. I mean, is there something that, that comes to mind that is resonant to you? I mean, I guess it's only notable in that we don't talk about it. Um, like what facets yeah. specifically? I don't know. I, I mean, I certainly, uh, I certainly wonder, uh, well, I wonder to even, I, okay, I have to be vague about this. Yeah, uh, I mean, kind of the specifics. I certainly wondered whether um, patients uh, are going to exhibit prejudice against some of our residents um, and I'll, uh, uh, specifically some of our um, Middle Eastern residents who are more visually different may have a more marked accent, mm -hmm. et cetera. And um, just how that's going to play into the interaction. My, my, who, who does the burden of like, cause how do you, how do you change that? Right. How do you address it? How it, is it, is the burden of um, effort still fall on the learner um, does it fall on the, the system? Does it fall on the preceptor who is, you know, responsible yeah. for it? Like, where does that go? We've never talked about it. And and that's, you know, maybe something that should come up in residency committee meeting is like, you know, do the residents feel that they are, you know, facing this and feeling this? I don't tend to introduce residents or students before they go in because I feel like they are supposed to be there. And I frankly don't want to give the patient a choice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really think they should have much of a choice. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be different if someone was cutting open their belly uh, and they wanted someone with more experienced hands. But mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I'm not protecting them in any way, or maybe I am by just not not creating any situation. I don't know, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I, cause I, and I also don't know to be, and I'm going to just call them out because there, again, uh, there may be cultural things I don't see, but, you know, do our, our Saudi or Omani residents face this stuff, but don't talk about it. I, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's like what avenue would that potential discussion come up, right? Like what would have to change in order for those conversations to take place? Yeah, I, I mean, would would it be that we have, a, you know, first of all, open the conversation in committee, in residency committee meeting and, and with the residents and try to get some uh, feedback and experiences, see what their thoughts, you know, do we need to bring, you know, EDI and staff and learners into the kind of conversation with patients when they come into the cancer center, you know, um, big poster or, or video thing saying, you know, we are a diverse family of, of educators, uh, et cetera. And we're all here for you. And, uh, you know, don't, don't be white. <laughs> But I mean, I think in that immediately, you know, what the the backlash of that can potentially be, right? Like, especially presently in a society that is very much dichotomized, and there is not a lot of room for nuance in people's day to day interactions with each other. Trying to create safe spaces for every person poses its own challenges because people feel that it infringes on their lived experiences. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, 
I don't know. I, like, I suppose depends on where you come from. But, a, you know, a, a big ass poster with a diversely represented population and certainly with white white people in there and et cetera, like truly diverse, um, which has a message of, you know, we're all here. We're all in this together. We're all here you know, to support each other. You know, let's let's uh, let's all help each other and accept each other. You know, is that a is that a challenging message for some people? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, ironically, I was thinking about getting older and I'm not allowed to think about that. But the, uh, you know, one of my greatest fears is actually fossilizing, um, both from a technological perspective and from uh, a cultural perspective. Like I recognize. Sorry, I thought you meant like actually become pe- like petrified in rock. And I was so confused. <laughs> I know, no, no. Yeah, that's funny. That, yeah, yeah. I don't want to go all Pompeii. <laughs> no, like, you know, I, because I find it very unattractive, uh, and I know it's, a, it's a risk because y- you, we, you know, we tend to live in echo chambers to some extent. And, you know, if you're not in a, a work environment, you're going to become one more step disconnected, et cetera. So, you know, so do, like it would have, would a poster, such as I mentioned, be a uh, discomforting to an average 80-year-old. Um, I don't know. And maybe, like you say, we kind of need to just do it and normalize it. You know, we just need to show images and just uh, and, and just make it happen. This is us. And... Uh, So, you know, live it or don't, but. Mm -hmm. I guess the other question that I then have just as a a moment of reflection is that is like the patient facing side of it. What are some barriers that could exist within the system, within the department or division um, that would need addressing and what would be barriers from allowing us to address it? Like, how do you motivate, say, a mid-career staff to give a damn? How do you motivate um, our, you know, other um, personnel who work within the cancer center who are maybe not patient-facing? Like, how do you motivate the system to care? I think you can do it on a compassion grounds is, uh, you know, presenting information and and anecdotes. Um, you know, I think people respond well to stories better than to cold data. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, that said, the uh, HHS, you know, share messages that come out that maybe there's even some of that in there, but I delete them before I even look at the, the, the head title um, just because of time and overall interest. Um, but, you know, I, I think it has to be messaging that comes from leadership. Uh, it has to come from, you know, trusted individuals. So individuals maybe who are within the system. And that could be, you know, residents, uh, with, uh, um, you know, resident, le- resident leaders. Uh, it could be, you know, nurse leaders, um, people who can just relay what this is like for them. I think that would be the most motivating thing because it's like, oh, that's our colleague and they're facing this. I don't, like, I don't see it, but wow. Um, as opposed to, you know, a uh, kind of some sort of bland, bureaucratic, woke agenda that will turn people off uh, by reaction. And I, I think it's probably true even even for people who are interested. Um, you know, certain things bug me because I think they're just uh, – and I use the term pejoratively, woke, meaning possibly extreme or irrational just for the sake of, of staking a position um, versus, you know, inclusive or open-minded uh, where we can have discussions about things and bring in everybody in and, and kind of – you know, still have room for dialogue, even if it's, you know, sensitive topics. Mm. So I I think it's possible, but there has to be leadership. There has to be stories. There has to be, I think, individuals that we can relate to. Mm -hmm. And that can be a, you know, just any, any colleague within our system that there must be individuals who would, uh, you know, speak to this. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that could make it relevant to almost anybody at any any career point. Um, so that's the st- the, you know, maybe the step to get them aware. Mm-hmm. And then you need to make it easy for them to engage. Um, you know, I think we're all tired of additional, uh, you know, whether it's epic training or fire training or women's training or uh, that came out in the dictation as women's training, but it's W A <laughs> training. <laughs> Uh, safety is what it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, th- and and I still, uh, you're, you're a better educator, probably uh, at least in theory, than than I am in terms of how do you execute something that's achievable on a topic like this amongst busy schedules and various interested people. But and, and there also has to be, um, by necessity, a homogeneity to it. Um, because it like as much as I think there is a general recognition that the individual has individual needs and individual like learning objectives in reality, you can't give everyone a one on one it's just an impossibility, so it's like how do you design a set teaching um module or a set curricula or a set intervention um that is able to meet the needs of most? Because ultimately, mm-hmm. that's that's all you can ever achieve, right? Is most, not all. Yeah, this is um that we Jill and I watched. Sorry, this is a bit of a, a jump, but Jill and I watched a program on Apple uh, recently that came out, uh, and it's a series of short movies or whatever on women, and it was a very interesting episode on a black writer who is whose book was she thought going to be made into a movie but actually it was going to be made into a virtual reality experience mm-hmm. uh, about her background which include being racialized mm-hmm. and uh and then they really twisted it so that you were essentially in that virtual reality experience uh and understanding how her voice had been eliminated as someone with, with a um, a minority background, mm-hmm. uh, which is one just to advocate because it's a good program, but two, you know, are there creative ways of of uh, giving people the experience of what this is like without making without trivializing it? Mm-hmm. I don't think we can. I don't think I can realize what it's like to be you know, um, addressed differently in a checkout line or maybe butted in front of or ignored or something in a retail experience, just a a trivial, not trivial, but like, I suppose the, the microaggression or, you know, that kind of, uh, not aggression necessarily, but, but, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I, and, and is there a way to make that, you know, an experience or at least for people to see that experience. Yeah. And so to some extent, yeah, I mean, this, yeah, you have to make it homogeneous. You have to make a, a a curriculum or a couple of curriculum curriculi. I don't know. It's it's hard because no matter what you do, if you're going to try to give somebody examples and show them at some point, they're going to be like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And if you try to bring them in, to the uh to an experience you know they're going to be looking at their watch or their phone or you know yeah but you're never gonna whatever right? that's just a fact it's hard yeah. it's hard yeah that's hard any other uh takeaway comments or or points that you want to make no i'm, I'm curious to see your uh your thesis in the end that's well it, it's interesting okay hold on let me pause the recording um...